Hello, everyone, and thank you for catching this recording. We are four diverse women from different backgrounds and fields, and we are here to help others on their road to wellness. So I want to start out today by introducing um, each of these wonderful women. Um, Dr. Dolores Fazino, would you kick us off? Oh, thanks, Kelly. I appreciate that. Yes, I'm Dr. Dolores Fazino. I'm a nurse practitioner, medical intuitive, author and speaker, and I help people heal in ways they never thought possible. Awesome. And Jennifer Tolo, would you please introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Jennifer Tolo. I'm an RN, whole health educator, author, speaker, chaos tamer, and mother of four. So I help people tame the chaos in their lives so they can take back control of their health and happiness. Awesome. And Janet, could you please introduce yourself? I'm Janet Doerr. I'm a medical intuitive and energy healer, uh, grandmother of two uh, little ones. We have grown, grown children with families. And my focus is helping people to uncover, discover, and resolve the underlying root causes of health and sometimes life experiences that they're having that they would like to shift that have an energetic root. Awesome. Thank you, Janet. I'm Kelly Meyerson. I'm an occupational therapist by trade, but my most favorite thing happens to be our topic for today, and that is sleep. I am a sleep expert, and I love helping overwhelmed working moms get wellness into their lives, beat that burnout, and find themselves having so much joy and extra energy. So I'm really excited about the topic of sleep today. Most people don't get so excited when they think about sleep. They're either thinking I'm not getting enough or I'll sleep when I'm dead, which um, it is my personal mission to get rid of that whole concept and really reclaim the importance, the core importance to our health and well-being um, that sleep affords us. Um, so ladies, I want to start today with this question. Tell me about the worst sleep of your life. Jen, I'm going to go to you first because <laughs> you have four boys. So I'm sure you have incredible stories of poor sleep. Can you kind of give us the worst case scenario that you've experienced? Well, I would say I, I kind of have two scenarios because one has to do with just not allowing myself to get enough sleep. So not getting enough sleep. So I was tired just because it was constantly disruptive. And another is when my, my mind wouldn't let me get good quality sleep. So I might've been laying down my eyes closed, but I wasn't really sleeping and able to really get that rest and relaxation of sleep. So um, obviously any mom with young children, especially more than one knows that it's really hard to get good quality sleep when you are disrupted continuously. So, um, you know, I, I remember when, so I had with my fourth son, my third son had leukemia, literally the right in the middle of me delivering my third, my fourth son, my, I was in the middle of going through leukemia with my fourth son or my third son. So um, I slept in the hospital and had, really just interrupted sleep continuously, whether it was the nurses coming in, whether it was, you know, checking on my son, my son asking me for something. What, um, and then when I would, once I had my baby, you know, when I did have those moments where I could sleep, waking up constantly to feed, I breastfed, so feeding the baby. Um, so that was probably some of my, and I don't function well on little sleep. So I would get foggy, I would feel almost, I would call it a sleep hangover with that nausea and just not really able to, I, I, I knew I needed to eat something because I was breastfeeding, but I just was nauseous all the time. I was making mistakes often, um, driving. I was probably dangerous driving behind a wheel, to be honest with you. Um, and, you know, I was really snappy and reactive to my husband. Um, and, so, and sometimes to my older to my older kids. Um, so that was just as far as like the the hours of sleep. I wasn't getting enough hours of sleep, and I was I was a hot mess. And then, as my my kids were older and sleeping through the night, 
my mind would get in the way of my quality of sleep. So sometimes I found that like I was showing up for everybody during the day and some of my, I was, I had my business then I was working. Um, but I would find that I would work when the kids went to sleep. So I would be up later doing some of the things and my kids, or I might be going to bed at maybe midnight, but my kids were up at six o'clock in the morning. So that was disrupting my, my hours of sleep. But then on top of that, my mind would be racing and I would go to sleep, but I would wake up with just a, but I call it a brain buzz with just all this stuff going through my head. Um, so I, I really had to learn how to quiet that stuff and how to re, you know, reprioritize my sleep and reprioritize or, or figure out ways that I could get better quality sleep. So I, I'm happy to say that was probably 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm, I sleep much better. I still have moments though. But those were my two worst periods of my life with uh, pretty messed up sleep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can definitely relate as a mom. And I think if I could give any advice, like going back to me as a new mom or to other new moms, like prioritize your sleep and rest and call in everybody yes. and their brother to clean the kitchen, make the food, hold yeah. the baby, you know, and just moms have this inherent ability to recover sleep. Like that's yep. the only people in the world that can actually like catch up a little bit on sleep. I think that's the design so that we can survive and perpetuate right. our species forward. Right. So I think that's such a great the, point. The reprioritize I think is key because mm -hmm. so many of us are trying to do everything and be everything. And sometimes you, you just can't. So reprioritizing the sleep is like, yeah, do I want my kitchen clean? Yes. Do I want to get this blog out to everyone? Yes. Do I want to do some of these follow, whatever it is, work-wise? Yes. But exactly, I had to learn to reprioritize and say sleep is important because I'm I'm not able to do anything if I can't function and if I'm so, so tired. I remember when I was sleep deprived, even after with my second son, like my first son, slept and was doing okay. And then I was exhausted with this new baby and my second son had that had the stroke. So he was not your typical child as far as sleeping and everything. And I remember being exhausted and saying, I just need to sleep. And they said, well, you have to sleep when the baby sleeps. I was like, oh yeah, who's gonna watch the toddler? <laughs> because they're not always in a perfect world, they'd be on the same sleep schedule, but that's not reality. So the reality is, just what you said, Kelly, sometimes you have to get a babysitter or have somebody come in and instead of running errands or going to do something, sleep. I mean, the, the, the athletes take naps all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And the other thing too, it's like, I think so many people don't give themselves permission yes. to sleep or take a nap. Yes. And that's, well, they that's, think it's a weakness, like you're being lazy. Absolutely. Obviously, there's a stigma to that. Right. But it's a necessity for your oh, overall yeah. health and wellness. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. Tell us more about that. What is, what is your worst sleep ever, Dolores? Oh my God. There's two things that come to mind. One of them was when I was in my twenties and working shift work. Um, we would work, I was working in the ICU at the time and we'd be six months on nights, six months on days. And there was a period of time where I would come home and I didn't sleep for three days and I was working and it was just like, I just couldn't function. And I don't know if it, what exactly was the trigger with that, but I know that I ended up getting some Benadryl from work. <laughs> you know, back then they didn't, you know, charge everybody for the, the way they charge and itemize stuff. So I just took some Benadryl and I took like 25 milligrams and I slept for like the next 14 hours. And then I had to go to work that night, but it was like, I was beyond exhaustion. Um, so I think, and I'm not really sure what the, the trigger was for that, but it's a sleep you know, wake cycle. Yeah, I had the definitely. same thing as a definitely. shift work. It's like, am I on a day schedule or am I on a night schedule? <laughs> Your body doesn't know. So oh, I think yeah. that, I mean, I had that same thing. Forgot and about then, that. And then the other thing was this one, this happened probably about almost 12 years ago where I would just, I, I just couldn't sleep. 
And it was almost as if my body was going through some chemical um, hormonal shift or whatever. It was like, I would wake up, you know, in the middle of the night and it was like, I would have this retching that would just, it, it was like, it was scary stuff. And I really wasn't sure what that was all about. And what actually solved that problem was going to the acupuncturist mm. and just, you know, somehow my meridians were blocked, crisscrossed or whatever. And just one dose of like acupuncture just corrected that whole thing. So, um, and at that time I was going through massive stress. So mm -hmm. in a way, you know, I'm sure that was the icing on the cake of what was going on deeper, but yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you both brought up shift work because, you know, I think about, um, especially in the past year, how short staffed a lot of hospitals um, and clinics were as a result of people being sick or people just, you know, fleeing the profession because it was so terrifying for so many people. And um, we are not at our best when we're so depleted of sleep. So this idea of putting your critical medical care in the hands of people who are sleep deprived seems a little on the unsafe side of things, right? So Very yeah, <laughs> thank you for bringing that to light. Um, and I think that's something to consider and that's a whole other ball of wax. You know, people who are existing in the evenings and sleeping during the day. Um, it really goes against how our bodies work. So yeah, I think that's, that's maybe even a discussion to table for another day because that Absolutely. is like a different set of advice and, and rules. And you two ladies, of course, being um, nurses understand so well what that experience is like. So Janet, I'm going to pop over to you. Can you tell us when was a time in your life that you were experiencing really poor sleep? Well, I'm going to give a very different answer. And I did relate with the moms that took me back 30 years to the days of, of my own children and sleep deprivation and so forth and remembering. Uh, but, but one of the things that happened for me was quite unexpected, but common for those people who start on a spiritual path. And that was as I was cleaning up my body and detoxing and meditating and raising my frequency, then what happens is the stuck emotion that's been trapped in our energy system and in our cellular memory starts to come up. And so I started experiencing night terrors. And I would go to bed at night, fall asleep, wake up in the middle of the night with just terror running through my body uh, shaking, crying, disturbed, because what I was seeing in my mind's eye was just horrific. And then that kind of led to a whole series of questions about, did this happen to me? Is this past life stuff? Is this something is happening to someone else and I'm perceiving it? What is going on? And it was getting very, very, very disturbing. Um, to the point that I would go to bed and dread falling asleep because I you know, knew that I would wake up in the middle of the night and be just in terror for two hours. So one of the things as I asked for help from spirit, you know, you gotta help me with this because this is like too much, um, was I was guided to any, some essential oils. And one of them was this little, this little bottle of oil, juniper berry. And when we've got this release of these deeply held emotions and old energies, it's in our subtle bodies. It's not in the physical body per se, it's in the layers of our energy body. And it often is from other timelines, past lives, ancestors, you know, it can be from all different kinds of origins. And this little oil, um, I went to an essential oil gathering of three or four women and because I had asked, then um, I was given a solution without even, I didn't ask the question in the meeting, <laughs> but the solution was offered to me. And this, so the, the solution I got was 10 drops of juniper berry, two drops of lemongrass, which I found to be incredibly soothing, and one drop of helichrysum, 
in an equal amount of about 10 drops of another oil, a, 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 a diluting oil, a carrier oil. Thank you, I was looking for that word. Um, I used fractionated coconut oil, but the jojoba oil is commonly used when people are blending oils. And the, the power in that was this little oil, juniper berry is called the oil of night. Huh. And it works to work in the subterranean, unconscious, subconscious emotions and trapped energy to, to resolve them as we sleep. So as soon as I got on this, where it was this plus, as I said, 10 drops of the juniper berry, two drops of lemongrass, one drop of helichrysum to another 10 or so drops, equal portion basically, of fractionated coconut oil. And then I applied it here on my high heart. And, and the lemon oil, lemongrass oil really calmed me. So when a person is having terror energy or anxiety at a very high level, um, a variety of different essential oils applied to the palm, sniff, take a deep breath, takes that into the limbic area of the brain and can dramatically calm ourselves down. So what I was doing with that lemongrass was the real soother. And so I would put that on here and then I would smell it and then I had it on my hands, you know, so I'd take another uh, whiff. And I found I was then able to relax. I wasn't going to sleep in fear that I was going to wake up terrified again. And after about three or four nights of that, I no longer woke up and the oils just helped the subtle bodies of my energy system process the energy and relieve myself of it. And the terror went away. So that was really profound and scary and not anything you hear talked about. Um, I've never heard anybody talk about what's going on with night terrors like that. So that was a real powerful help. And for anyone who feels even just anxiety when they go to bed, um, a lot of people are familiar with lavender oil. You know, take a little bit, put some next to you, maybe have some lavender petals and, you know, squish them a bit to release some of that before one goes to bed. Has that same, let's just kind of shift from wired but tired, Jennifer mentioned earlier when we were talking, that energy to uh, now I need to, now I lay me down to sleep, you know, <laughs> and that diffusers do you like um diffusers like my son i will say who has trouble sleeping i have a diffuser going yes. but I, I i know some people like some of the carrier oils when you put it on the person is great but i'm just curious as far as do you do you have a preference as far as on the body or diffusing in the air um there are perfect applications for both uh with a child diffusers i think are are preferred because then you don't know necessarily about their skin is so delicate, skin sensitivity. Some of the oils are a little more spicier, hottier, you know, than others. Uh, so when in doubt, diffuse. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and for an adult, take the drop, put it on your hand, put it like this to the child's nose and say, take a deep breath. That's another way to get a, you know, mm -hmm. a fast amount in. For me, my skin is... Um, pretty tough and oils didn't bother me other than I will say lemongrass being a grass after multiple days of doing that sometimes I got a little itchy spot because of the you know the reaction of the grass um, but for me I want it in my aura if I'm trying to really have it help me so on my ham sniff get it in the brain get it rapid fire into the uh, cardiovascular system through respiration and because I had obviously deep heart wounds from an unknown timeline that was traumatic by putting it right up here on my high heart. We have a heart chakra a little lower, but the high heart area was a beautiful area where we connect energetically to our higher self. And, and also it was a little bit of you know prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray to the Lord, I get a good night's sleep and ask for help from me, you know. Ask, I like that variation. I know, I was gonna say, I don't remember that version. <laughs> ask, ask, uh, ask the angels to assist me, please dissolve whatever this energy and this terror from my body, I, I release it. And I, you know, within a very short period of time, I was getting much better and calm again. So 
it was it was powerful. Wow, thank you for that. I have to tell you, Janet, I can completely relate to you. Um, when I was a kid, I, I struggled with sleep my whole life. So when I was a kid, I experienced very traumatic night terrors hmm. um, to the point where, like you said, I was afraid to go to sleep. Um, they became way more intense uh, as I got older. So in high school, I used to actually sleep with the light on and music playing to try and um, prevent the night terrors from coming on. Um, there seemed to be some correlation for me between um, high levels of stress. I mean, if you can think about high school and, you know, you want to get into a good college and I was in a very perfectionistic state for most of my life. So I think that also played into it, a lot of like fear and anxiety. Um, and so the worst of it for me was in college. Um, I actually would have friends watch me sleep to see like, am, can you see when I start to go into a night terror? Um, I had some that were like, like there was somebody coming into my dorm room and I would have night terrors personally where the night terror would occur exactly where I was sleeping. So I would, you know, wake up in the environment I was in and these sounds and things were happening. And so um, I so wish that I had had someone like you to talk to at that time in my life. Um, and um, I, I think as a result, I became a sleep avoider. Um, and I would just proudly proclaim that I was a night owl. And um, I can relate to what you were saying, Jen, about being incredibly sleep deprived and very unsafely so. I can remember driving and falling asleep on the road, you know, um, being on like a 30 minute commute and not being able to keep my eyes open. Um, thank God I never got into any kind of an accident, but I think about that all the time. I mean, the statistics show that driving while tired is as dangerous, if not more so, than driving under the influence of alcohol or other um, drugs. So it it is not to be um, taken lightly if you've not slept well and you're driving and it's very unsafe. Yeah. So I want to shift a little now because I know as you're watching and you're hearing these stories and you're relating to them, you're thinking to yourself, all right, ladies, I want to know what are your top tips? How do you get your best sleep now? So mm -hmm. we're going to talk a little bit about really good sleep hygiene and what are the do's and don'ts, what works and what doesn't. Um, so Jen, I'm going to pop back over to you because you already started us on a roll mm -hmm. um, of what works and what doesn't. Yeah, well, I would say... Um, one of the things that I think prevents people from sleeping, so the don'ts is that, per, um, I wanna almost say it's like a super mom thing or a super person thing. That's people that say like, well, I don't really need that much sleep. Or I've heard parents say that about their kids. Oh, well, they just don't need that much sleep. And as my kids would say, I smell cap, which means, <laughs> don't kill me for that one, but, which means that that's, that's just not true. Everybody requires at least seven hours of sleep. I mean, it's just science has proven that. Our bodies, that's where the cytokines get released. That's where we fight inflammation. That's where we regenerate. That's where we rest. That's where we um, rejuvenate and sort of reconnect to our, to our mind, body, and spirit. It's where we connect. Sometimes I have dreams. I have very vivid dreams. And oftentimes when I have these thoughts that keep coming in, I keep a journal on the side of my bed that I call my dream journal. Because when they, when I am working through some things, energetically, the guides, source, spirit will help me process that while I sleep. So mm -hmm. I will wake up and I will jot down. When I ignore it, that's where I fight and I can't go back to sleep. So I've learned to keep a journal. I journal before I go to bed when I have a lot on my mind. It's like a way for me to purge what's happening. What not to do is to ignore it or to um, distract yourself from it by like watching television or I know people that wake up and they're woken up by things and maybe the, the thoughts in their head where they try to distract themselves. The key is to like connect to yourself, reconnect to yourself. 
So I journal before I go to bed as a way to purge and as a way to kind of clear my energy. And if I do wake up in the middle of the night with a reoccurring thought, I've literally written a song for my son in the middle of the night because the words just kept playing in my head. So I got up, it was like two in the morning. I wrote it down and then I was able to go right back to sleep. So it's like this subconscious that keeps you awake because your, your, your spirit is afraid you're going to forget it. So writing it down. Right. Um, I, another thing that has really helped me falling asleep is making sure that I sort of have a sleep routine and I shut off the electronics at a certain time. Um, so I will shut off the electronics and I like to read to unwind because I sometimes just need that. I'm on and I need to unplug, whether that's a hot bath. Sometimes depending on my day, it could be a hot bath. Um, almost always I read before I go to bed and always I journal before I go to bed. So that's my sleep and stretching too. Sometimes I stretch because sometimes my body cramps or, or different ailments as I get older, um, will wake me up. Uh, so I stretch. So that's part of my sleep routine. So I've created a sleep routine for myself, but then one of my issues as far as fa um, waking up in the middle of the night sometimes whether we all have those moments where we've all talked about where we're stressed or we have a lot on our mind. Um, and I like to do a body scan meditation when I do wake up. And that body scan meditation is again, helping me connect to my body and just re like tune into the messages of my body and consciously with attention, relax my body with breath and just tuning into my body and each, I go through literally through the systems. And then as Janet mentioned, I work with angels. So I call in the angels and I ask the angels, particularly Archangel Michael to help me feel protected and help me sleep. And I ask Archangel Gabriel, the messenger angel to help me um, remember the messages in the morning. Oh my gosh. That, all of that is so beautiful. I love that. And uh I, I work with a lot of people who have that busy brain and yes. sometimes busy brain is anxiety, right? Yep. A lot of stress, uh, which we talked about in a previous video. Um, but sometimes it's creativity. Sometimes it's messages yes. coming through. Um, so uh, I love that you're having this inner dialogue with yourself and with your <laughs> guides. And I can completely relate to that. Um, and also to the practice of mind dumping before bedtime. I love to ask people that 30 minutes before bed, sit someplace away from your bed and um, just dump everything that comes out. Keep that journal next to your bedside. So like if you are a creative person, you probably haven't been still very often during the day. Yes. So when your body gets still at night, all of a sudden it's like, oh, hey, hi, I got some ideas for you. Let's, let's get a little download happening. I got some great creative ideas. So I think it's also pairing that with in the beginning of your day or sometime early in your day, giving yourself some time that you're still and you're sitting and you're breathing and you're connecting with your inner self and you're opening yourself up to wisdom and ideas wherever you believe they come from so that your, your body isn't so desperate and craving that when you lay down to go to sleep at night. So I think those are some great strategies for people and I think the one thing I would add is um, to not feed into the frustration when you wake up in the middle of the night, because sometimes there's a reason you woke up right. from a dream that's important. Right. You know, there's something that you need to know when you have a little bit of clarity and that like little bit of sleepiness that's happening. So I will always say to myself, okay, I'm awake. It's okay. Don't look at your clock and start calculating how many more hours you're going to get and when you're going to have to get up and when the alarm is going to go off instead of that. And you know, I can relate to that. I'm sure you all are laughing. So you know how I have a rule. Don't look at the clock because don't sometimes when I have clock. to get up early and I'm worried about missing something, yes. if I look at the clock, I can't go back to sleep. Right. Then you start. Yeah. You yeah. start to spin, right? We all know that. Yeah. Spin. So, um, instead just being okay, I get to the point where I'm okay if all I do is lay here and just like simmer in the deliciousness of stillness and rest, 
and just be okay with, I'm supposed to be awake and alert right now, but I'm going to lay here and rest until it's time for me to fall asleep again. And sometimes it's a long time, you know, if there's a full moon, like that will always get me, you know, whether it's the light or it's just the energies that are around and I'm really tuned into them at this point in my life. Um, but letting just that, like I'm laying down and I'm resting and it's okay. I'm going to be okay. And then sometimes what I'll do is I have a visualization that I do where I start to think about in the best possible way, how my day is going to be. So from the time I wake up to like, just taking that first deep breath and being aware of being awake and gratitude for my life to putting my feet down on the carpet on my floor and making my coffee. And I go very slowly and deliberately through every step and visualize it. And usually that will help you fall back to sleep. So, all right, Janet, I'm coming to you. I see you nodding your head. What have you got for us? This is all really good stuff. I'm gonna uh, share a couple of practical things. Uh, when our bodies need to move, and so if we have had a day of sitting, uh, the body is not happy and the muscles need to move. So number one, we need to tire out our physical vessel. Children know this. They go out and play and tear around and, you know, and then they sleep well. And instead, what do a lot of us do? You know, way too much screen time, way too sedentary, and then wonder why we're not getting a good night's sleep. So we need to make sure that we're putting in a, a good 30 minutes, if not an hour, of good, vigorous um, physical exercise of some kind. It can be simply a walk or two 15 minute brisk walks when one has a, a break from a busy schedule. So that'd be one. Um, second, if the diet doesn't have enough minerals in it and therefore the body gets tired because it's not getting the minerals it needs, and so then a person may be substituting caffeine, sugar, flour, breads, you know, all that stuff uh, to try to keep their blood sugar pumping during the day. So they can like, oh, I need something here. I need something because I need that perk up. Well, that's a complete recipe for disaster. So, so minerals, we need to be eating a diet that is full of color red beets and orange carrots and yellow pineapples and dark green spinach and broccoli and Brussels sprouts and cauliflower, white cauliflower and onions and garlic. And the more of all the good original whole foods that we're eating with a lot of color, then we're gonna have a lot more nutrients. And the number one nutrient that most people now are deficient of, and when I started um, my intuitive gifts awoke, the very first thing that woke up was my ability to discern what minerals a person was missing. And I don't really do much of that work, you know, now because I'm really on to energy and past lives and other things, but magnesium, 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 magnesium. Very, very true. So calcium is the mineral that causes our muscles to contract. So your heart needs both. If it wants to pump, it first contracts and then it relaxes, which allows the blood to fill into it, and then it contracts and pumps, and then it relaxes and brings in more blood. So we're, we're needing to have our calcium and magnesium in balance. Contract, relax, contract, relax. And the standard American diet is way too much calcium, dairy, cheese, da, 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 and hardly any nuts and seeds and green foods and plant matter that all have magnesium in it. So if, if we're tight and our muscles are like this, they're saying, I don't have the mineral I need to relax, which is magnesium. So Epsom salts, uh, soaking in it in a bath or a lot of people, you know, say, well, I'm too busy to blah, blah, blah. Well, we sit for 15 minutes every day, checking <laughs> mail, doing this. We can plunge our feet into a big cooking pot with a uh, couple of cups of Epsom salts, bare feet with our robe, you know, while we're waking up in the morning. And that can be the time that we can recharge with magnesium. So Epsom salts is magnesium sulfate. And the very, very best way to supplement with magnesium is through the skin, transdermally. 
Then it goes immediately into the blood vessels, all those places where your blood vessels are close to the surface. The body goes, thank you, and soaks it up and takes it right into the bloodstream. Um, supplementing magnesium with almost any kind of magnesium is hard on the kid kidneys. Yeah, there are some that are more bioavailable than others. Magnesium threonate, magnesium glycinate may be better than other forms, but the best, the best, the best is through our skin. So those are a couple of real practical things. And then I want to talk about energy. Um, I think everybody would remember if you've gone out camping or you went to visit a family or friend and they lived in a remote area, um, how well you sleep. Invariably, you go out, you know, and you sleep well. Well, what's that about? There's no cell towers. There's no Wi-Fi in every home. The cell phones are not pinging you. So we're getting bombarded with electromagnetic um, frequency radiation of all forms. And it also correlates, the more everybody's got a gadget, the worse their sleep is, positively correlated. So one of the things we do here at our house is, um, I, I had to insist about eight years ago, much to the consternation of my husband, but he got over it, is that the Wi-Fi goes off at 10 o'clock and the Wi-Fi comes back on, first person up is entitled to bring it back on. I can sense energy. And so I can tell if the Wi-Fi is on or not. And so I strongly encourage people who are everybody, and especially with children in your home, uh, to turn the Wi-Fi's off at night. They cycle up just fine. Unplug them, plug them back in, take a breath, and in one or two minutes, it you know powers back up the house and you're good to go. So turn the Wi-Fi off, turn the cell phones off, and get them at least 20 feet away from your body. If you need to use the, um, the clock to wake yourself up, as it's your alarm clock, well, set it on high and send it 20 feet away. It'll still be loud enough to wake you up. So there's no excuse for having a cell phone next to your body. You are hurting your body in a big, big way. Um, so those things, and then the other thing is getting grounded. And I'll tell the story, and then maybe uh, Dolores would segue. Um, during the, it was intended that we all would be grounded. What does that mean? B bare feet touching the ground. And if you look at um, all of nature, all nature is in contact with the earth and the earth provides a source of electrons. Electrons are cooling and grounding us. So we calm down, it slows down the inflammation response and it also allows us to sleep really, really well. So I have mat, like as we're talking, I've got a mat underneath my feet, my feet are bare. It's plugged into a cord, which goes to that gr ground outlet. You know, when you're three plung plug, you have two pluggy guys and then there's a hole. That's the ground energy. And so I have a, a device called a grounding mat that plugs into that, plugs into the wall socket and that plugs down into the earth. So I'm constantly receiving these electrons, which are cooling and calming, cooling and calming. So my body's in a happier state. And then at night I sleep on an earthing mat, which is underneath my sheet. And in a prior call we'd had, I would shared about that. And Dolores is gonna tell us in a minute, I encourage you to. She went out and bought one and already has noticed differences. Um, so then I'm getting another eight hours in contact with the earth. So I try to get 15, 18 of my 24 hours a day, bare feet on the ground, touching or sleeping on that earth mat. And those things are very, very powerful for improved sleep. So awesome. Oh my gosh, I love that. So I just want to unpack some of that because that was beautiful information. So, first of all, magnesium. And what I love about that is if you were listening, we just gave you a reason to take a nice hot bath with some magnesium, salt. with those Epsom salts, soak in that bath. The great thing about soaking in a bath before bedtime is even though it makes you warm in the moment, when you come out of the bed, it's actually gonna lower your body temperature. And one of the ways in which our body prepares for sleep is to drop in temperature. That's why it's better to have a cooler bedroom, make it a little bit darker to really inform your body that it's time to sleep. So thank you so much for bringing that up, Janet. And then 
the technology, yes, not only for what you were saying, and I think the energetics are huge, the Wi-Fi, that's a huge piece, but because when we leave our cell phones next to our bed, we become tempted when we wake up, as we were speaking about before, to start to scroll through social media. It is the worst time of day between 11 p.m. and 4 a.m. to be introducing your eyes to a screen. It is literally rewiring your body for how we're, we're supposed to be sleeping in a different way. So not having any screen time or lights in our eyes between that 11, and 11 p.m. and 4 a.m. is going to help us to sleep better. Waking up and getting some light into our eyes, some natural light within the first hour of sunrise, and this is outside looking for just a minute or two, it actually sets a timer in our bodies that's already, it's a beautiful design. This is what I'm getting excited about, right? I love the science of how our bodies work, but you literally set a timer for 12 to 14 hours for that release of melatonin that is going to help you feel like you're ready to sleep. So I think those are such great strategies that you brought up, Janet. So Dolores. Can I just okay. add one quick thing? Cause Please. when um, Janet was talking about food, or, you know, nutrition. One of the things I wanted to mention too is a don't because yes. I have a lot of clients that come to me and when I look at their food journals, one of the things I find is there are a lot of people that have trouble sleeping. They're, I call it backloading their food. So they, they wait, they don't eat a lot in the morning. They don't eat a ton in the afternoon, but then all of a sudden they're starving. So they're eating up until when they go to sleep. And so when you do that, your body is on going to bed. Your body is not able to fully relax. So try, I like to tell people, try to front load your food, eat breakfast and lunch, have a lighter dinner and, and keep the, um, the food at least two hours away from when you fall asleep. Yeah, I love that. And I think um, having a technology fast right? Those two to three hours before mm -hmm. bedtime and having a fast in terms of what you're eating as well. Um, and again, being super cautious of those um, caffeinated beverages, energy drinks, those kinds yes. of things, you know, um, they are not a supplement for poor sleep. They, no. They're doing the opposite and they're spiraling you. They're so, fake energy making you wired and tired. And it, and, and the teenagers are all over this. My kids come in with the monster drinks and I say to them, if that comes into my house, I will dump it down the drain because that's not helping you. It's no. actually harming you like yes. the, like the EMF. I'm going to battle them about the well, electronics you know, out of the room next. And, and I'm going to say something <laughs> in regards to that too, the energy drink thing. Mm. You know, there's a lot of young people showing up in the EDs, the emergency departments with, um, you know, chest pain and heart attacks. Yeah. And they, they do the history and they, they're drinking, you know, mega doses of the, those energy drinks every day. And that's not helping. So no. um, I have a college student and some of the things that the college kids are doing is the drinks, the mixing drinks yep. is Red Bull yep. and alcohol. Absolutely. Like vodka or whatever it's, or, or they do those shots of the five hour energies. Yeah. With oh, yeah. Yes, yes. It's, and it's, it's a hot mess. Yeah. It's a very hot mess. So Dolores, tell us some more. Tell us some more best practices. Well, you know, one thing I want to talk about a little bit is, and we didn't even talked about is like people who have sleep apnea. Oh yeah. Okay. So that's a big problem, especially if people have a tendency to snore. A lot of times, you know, people don't know that they're doing these things if they live by themselves. Okay. Um, and sometimes there's a family history of it as well, you know, and it's called, you know, uh, sleep, you know, obstructive sleep patterns, where it's like you literally stop breathing, then all of a sudden, you know, after a prolonged period of time, you, you take that and then you, you're breathing again. And that actually disrupts your, your true sleep as well. So that's something to look at and how you address that is usually, you know, if you're snoring, there's a good chance that you have, you know, sleep, you know, sleep of some type of obstruction, airway obstruction when you're sleeping. And you could be as skinny as a rail or morbidly obese. It doesn't, 
you know, it doesn't know any difference. So if you're ever questioning that, ask your, um, your health care healthcare practitioner to do a sleep study to determine whether or not that is an issue for you. I speak from personal experience because um, my parents both were like chainsaw, you know, in our house, <laughs> one would be snoring and the other would be answering snoring. It was just like, and, you know, over time, you know, of course my parents are deceased, but my brother ended up being diagnosed with sleep apnea and it kind of changed his life. And my, one of my sisters was, and I'm thinking to myself, you know what, I'll bet you I have it too. Cause I live by myself and sure enough, I did. And I couldn't understand why I would sleep like, you know, eight and 10 hours and be totally exhausted when I got up. So for me, that was a game changer. Like four years ago, I got diagnosed with that and I have a CPAP machine and it's just like after two months, oh my God, what a difference. So that's one thing I'm going to say as well. It's like, if you have problems, you know, if you snore or your spouse snores, or, you know, you're questioning whether or not your sleep is being affected, get that checked out. The other thing I want to say too, is that the earthing thing I think is huge. I've just had it for about a week and I have it underneath my mattress pad in my, uh, on my bed. And I've noticed, you know, getting up, uh, you know, I'm not as achy as I usually am. And then the other thing too, I want to make note of too, is that weighted blankets, I know they're not for everybody, but if you're the type of person that likes a lot of layers on you, this is a real good um, added bonus, I call it. And I love it so much. And it's just like, it just keeps you cocooned in one area, especially if you're like a restless sleeper. Um, I'm laughing because, you know, my dad used to be he used to go out fishing and he would be catching the big tuna and in bed at night, he had that restless, <laughs> restless leg syndrome. So my mother would say, yep, Joe caught the big one last night. <laughs> <laughs> so I think mean, it's kind of funny, but you know, when we look at, you know, some of our children who have ADD and ADHD, they like to be hovered and, and, you know, um, I wouldn't say bound, but they feel better when they're covered and they they're secure. So that's another thing to, to look at too. Some people it'll resonate with and they do well with it. And some people, you know, just, you know, it, that's just too heavy for them, but it comes in different weights as well. Um, the other thing too, the magnesium is huge. Um, I think anybody who is involved in doing energy work, they need to, they burn through their magnesium quickly. And mm -hmm. so, you know, you may be taking bigger doses than what is recommended, but that's something that, you know, you need to check in with um, either doing muscle testing, you know, kinesiology, that type of thing of how much you actually need. Um, you know, and the other thing too, for me, it varies from, you know, day to day what I do, you know, cause I always just check in with myself. If I know that I'm getting to bed late and I have to be up by a certain time, I just say to the universe, okay, I'm going to wake you know, I'm asking you to, you know, allow me to get a good, tonight, good night's sleep so I'm rested when I have to wake up before the alarm goes off. And it usually happens. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you know, I think a lot of times people forget that, you know, we have helpers in the invisible realms. We have to ask them and direct them. They just mm -hmm. don't show up and say, poof, I'm here because <laughs> we are here of free will. Okay. Right. And their job is not to interfere unless they're asked. So the thing is, a lot of times we just forget to ask. So, yeah. you know, it's just like, you're, what are you, the Lone Ranger or something? It's just like, you just got to, you know, just realize, oh, there's help. You're never alone, folks. <laughs> you think you are, but you're not. We just made a lot of people really uncomfortable. <laughs> oh, my God. It's just like, there's this, <laughs> meme, there's this meme out, in, you know, in social media that all of these angels are looking down on earth. And, you know, just kind of looking and I, I put like a caption, I said, yes, those are all the angels that are waiting to help, but people have forgotten to ask. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, people forget to ask. I, I do think that we're in a society where everybody is mi a little mistrusting and thinks that they have to do everything on their own. And if they don't, they're weak. Yeah. Mm. And, and. You know, I, I was one of those people and honestly, it took the illness of two of my kids to for, for me to get the message of the universe that let people help you. I'm the first to help others. I'm the first in line to help others. 
but and it's it, it's and we've talked about ancestral history that's my ancestral history is that strength and you don't need anybody else you you have to be able to do everything on your own that self-sufficiency mm-hmm. you can be self-sufficient and still let somebody help you Absolutely. because it's more efficient <laughs> well, the thing is it's like it's a balance and i think you mm-hmm. know i address this a little we don't give ourselves permission yes and so it's okay to ask for help. You know, it doesn't make, make you a weak person, a bad person, an incapable person. Sometimes we just need some help and it's okay to ask. You're worth it. I think a lot of times people don't think they're worthy of it. So, yep. Yeah. And I think that's such a, a great piece of sleeping well because sleeping well, prioritizing sleep is like a core function of your self-care. Yes. Right. And so yes. believing you're worthy, practicing self-compassion, that's, mm-hmm. that all fits in together. It's, a, it all works together. So if people were listening and hearing this, we weren't talking just about what happens when you put your head on the pillow. We're talking about lifestyle. We're talking about habits. We're talking about, you know, how you're treating your human body as it was designed to function and understanding on so many different levels, the things that we can do as best practices for having a really good human machine so that we can do all the wonderful things that we want to do in the world. Right. And I think asking for help is such a big one. Maybe that's one we need to put on our list we need to talk about that. How do you ask for help? That's a good yes. topic for another. That's right? a good one. Um, so stay tuned for that. So <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to recap a little bit because you said some really beautiful things in there, Dolores, that I want to make sure we, we really peg the using a weighted blanket, I think is tremendous. I'm an occupational therapist. I'm trained in sensory integration. So We've been doing weighted, you know, things with kids for a long time. So I just want to give a little bit of history, in fact, on the weighted blanket. So what that's doing is it's giving deep pressure into our tactile system and over a large part of our body. So what that's doing is it's increasing a sense of calm and security and releasing some really healthy, positive neurochemistry Um, which can counteract some of the neurochemistry of stress, like adrenaline and cortisol. So for some people, they feel very exposed and vulnerable and anxious being in bed and sleeping. And that could be for a number of different reasons. So the weighted blankets can help sort of calm some of that anxiety and give that feel of comfort. If you think about what we do with newborns, we wrap them all up and we hold them very close to us. We're giving a lot of tactile sensation on them because they've spent nine months in the womb with all of this positive pressure on their body and feeling so comforted. So it's something that we can return to. The one item of caution I would say is like Dolores said, there's many different weights of blankets. As an adult, you can kind of go for it. Pick like the heavier, the better for you, or you want just a little bit. But for kids, we wanna be very cautious about how much weight because even a one pound to three pound weighted blanket is a lot heavier over the whole body. So for safety, for children, you want something that is less than 10% of their body weight so, you know, it's, it's going to be fairly light, even less if you can, and you want something that they can very easily remove from themselves. So you're not going to put a weighted blanket on um, a child who is not able to get up and walk. That's just going to be like my caution. Um, and you, and if you have a child with special needs who doesn't have the physical mobility to move a blanket off of them, we're not going to put a a weighted blanket on them unless it's been prescribed by a therapist that you're working with. And it's at a time where you're monitoring the child personally. So I just like to say that because (laughs) it becomes like safety. Yeah. Yeah, you get a it's definitely you get a blanket. <laughs> one other thing I wanted to one other and thing a grounding bed. <laughs> and a grounding bed. Everybody should have a grounding bed, though. I think that's totally yeah. yes. Please. So one other thing I wanted to say too, it's just like sometimes, you know, just listening to there's um, different frequencies of music. Oh yes. 
Like there's, I love the one that's 528 Hertz. Hertz, yes. And just listen to that and keep that in the background. Yes. Mm, because especially if you're having problems going to sleep, that just, you know, it, you know, some people like waterfalls, some people like mm. the rain dripping, you know, the sound, some type of sound therapy is also effective as well. Um, especially if you are, you know, a little anxious or a little high strung and it's taking you a while to get unwound. Also, there's times where, you know, your usual sleep pattern, maybe you go to bed at 10 o'clock, you're in bed by 10, no matter what. Um, when you fall asleep after that, it, it's, you know, it varies, but sometimes, you know what, if you feel the need that you're exhausted and you need to put yourself to bed, if it's five o'clock in the afternoon, I invite you to do so because mm. obviously you're beyond functioning. Yep. And the thing is, is when you're, you're so on overwhelmed that you're exhausted and you can't even think, I call it like, bleh, 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 bleh. it's just like, it's time to put yourself to bed, but you individually will know what that is. There are times that I've gone to bed at five o'clock in the afternoon and I've slept until seven o'clock the next morning because obviously I needed it. I process mm. a lot of my stuff in my sleep. Yep. I get a lot of downloads energetically. And the way that for me to re, you know, reboot my physical body is I have to go to bed. Yeah. And just it, it's about really knowing yourself, having that relationship with your body and listening to your body as to what it needs. That is just key. Mm. And I think we address that a little bit as well. I'd love to add to what you were saying as far as the, the music, because that was definitely on my list. And I find, um, you know, what a lot of people don't understand is that sound waves can actually affect brain waves. Yeah. So, um, you know, your brain waves adjust to the environment, you know, the, the frequency around it. So, um, that's part of like a sleep routine. So I would say whether it's a bath, whether it's journaling, whatever it is, creating a sleep routine for yourself, but also for kids, I think is important. Mm -hmm. Like I know my kids like to listen to music that is um, very uh, like alpha wave music, like very alert, very like intense, <laughs> like, right. And yeah. the, the waves for relaxation, you can Google this. I would love for us to maybe put some links on for some of the, the mm. products and the things yeah. that we're talking about. Absolutely. We'll, we'll add some links in, in the notes in the show notes, but, um, but theta waves are the late, the waves of deep relaxation and getting that music playing at the end of the day, maybe while you're stretching and moving your body to release the energy, maybe when you're, um, you know, in your bath or um, doing a foot soak or whatever it is that you're doing, just sort of allowing yourself to start to unwind and get out of that sympathetic nervous system and into that parasympathetic nervous system, which we talked about in our stress, um, our, our stress talk. Um, but I think that sound waves and music is a, is a wonderful way to do that. And there's a lot out there in 528 Hertz. I agree, Dolores, yeah. is awesome. You turned me on to that. And it, it's, it's been wonderful. I play it in the background, like at night. Well, you know what? And the thing is, even if you're stressed out during the day, it's great to have that as a background. Music yeah. Too. Mm. yeah. That's such Agreed. a good point. And you're speaking my love language, by the way, brainwaves, my love language. I love it. I love <laughs> the brain. You said sympathetic and parasympathetic and uh, my heart is singing. Our so, geek speak. <laughs> uh, I love the brain. So yeah, your nervous system, your brain waves. So when we came in and we were talking about the busy brains, people having trouble falling asleep, there are five brainwave states, okay? So delta is our sleep. Theta is kind of that cool, dreamy state right before we fall asleep. Alpha is alert and awake and learning. Beta is a higher energy. High beta is stress, defense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is what I talk to people all the time about. If you get into bed in a high beta state, stress, anxiety, defense, you got a long way to go, sister, before you're falling asleep. Okay, yep. so we, do, we don't do that. Let's not do that. That's why we say you got to unplug two hours before bedtime. You got to give yourself time to come down. So yeah, that theta, you know, getting in the right level, beautiful way to fall asleep, beautiful way to bring yourself down to listen to that music. I mean, I'm getting myself into this feeling of I'm taking a bath. I've got like low lights and candles. It's like romancing myself. It sounds fabulous listening to music. 
But what it's really about too is really embodying, right? Getting all those different sensations in. So we're getting out of here. We're coming down into our body and what our body needs. And then the last thing for me is your sacred sleep environment. So if your bedroom is a disaster zone, like mine was for most of my life, not now, you get into your bedroom and all you see are the unfinished projects. You see the piles of laundry that you still have to do. You have to fold these, you have to put that away, too many tchotchkes. So um, I like to coach people through the process of creating a sacred sleep environment. And then sort of building from there, building in different sensations, whether it's the essential oils we talked about, whether it's a weighted blanket or, you know, a beautiful meditation and stretching routine before bedtime. Listen, we can treat ourselves. We can be kind to ourselves. We need to sleep. It is imperative for life. There's a lot of things you cannot do. You could be dehydrated a little bit. You cannot eat for a few days. Three days of not sleeping and you're in a dire situation, right? Anybody who's had a new baby can relate to this. So, you know, this is something we have to do and it's time to make sleep cool again, okay? It is not cool to say, I'll sleep when I'm dead because you're gonna die sooner if you don't sleep. And I have news for you, you're not... <laughs> You're not sleeping when you're dead, so. <laughs> no, you're not. You're going to be busy then too. I love that, Dolores. And you know what? For anybody who's struggled with losing weight, with inflammation, as Jen pointed out earlier, you know, not sleeping well is correlated to having struggles with gaining weight or not losing weight, if that's a struggle for you. Hormone so, imbalance. Yeah, it's a hormone disruptor. <laughs> Yeah. So, so many things, right? Not to mention the, the inability for ourselves to be able to think and enjoy and be present in our lives. So sleep is the gift we should be giving ourselves, you know, eight hours any, every 24, right? Um, seven to nine hours. And I love what you said, Dolores, about, you know, everybody needs a different amount of sleep. And if you can tune in and honor that in yourself, I mean, there are days I'm like, I need a nap. I just need to lay down and like close my eyes for a few minutes. I'm feeling the pull to sleepiness. And in the past, I would have heard that. I'd be like, you don't have time to sleep. Like, look at the list of things you have to do. Mm. You can't do that. You got to tell that inner critic, listen, yes, I can. I am the boss of me and I want a nap. Well, and the other thing I just want to add to that is like, when you honor that, Believe it or not, after you have the nap, you accomplish way more than you totally. could have before. So the thing is, is like, just, you know, just allow yourself the luck, you know, people call it a luxury. It's not a luxury. It's a necessity. But I will say one of the things that um, I've noticed and that I've actually read about as far as the naps is sometimes if you nap too long, it can make you feel really tired. So, you know, like the, the power naps or the, you know, just... Like a lot of the athletes, I, I was reading up because one of my sons is really into basketball. And there are some basketball players that before games take a nap, but they say that there's a sweet spot for the amount of time mm -hmm. that nap should be, right? It should be about 20, 20 to 45 minutes, I think, was, the, was that nap. Um, and anything over an hour can sometimes start to make you almost too, too groggy mm -hmm. and not as alert. But for the alertness and the, the functionality, um, 20 to 40 minutes. Yeah. Good yep. point. Awesome. Well, I want to give each of us a chance to just say, you know, one more key component to a great night of sleep. Where should someone start? Okay, so there are people who are listening and they're watching and they're like, this all sounds great. I'm totally overwhelmed. Tell me where to start. Okay, Jen, where should they start? I would say start with understanding how you're going to transition because some of us are in this go mode and it's not realistic to think you're going to go from that right to sleep. So you need to come up with some plan to start and, and we'll have all these tips down for you. Pick a couple of things to start with, some things that resonate with you that you think are doable and start to create your own transition sleep routine. Um, I think that that's key. That's something that I've had to do is is figure out a way for me to go from pedal to the metal 
to, instead of just stopping the car, right? Just uh, stopping the vehicle, I have to learn how to slowly start to ease my foot off the gas. So then I can look around me, evaluate and go, okay, I've reached where I'm supposed to be right now. Now I can stop the car. <laughs> yes, I love that analogy that, that people can relate to. Okay, yeah. Janet, go ahead. What is, your, what is your number one tip? Well, as powerful creators, one of the things we need to pay very close attention to is how we talk about our sleep. Mm. And so we know the power of the words, I am, I am that I am. So what we don't want to do is say, I am, and then in the, what we would follow with, someone might say, not getting enough sleep. So just warning, that's what you're creating. If you're saying, I am, then describe the problem. <laughs> so uh, some words that I would like people to focus on is to say, I am, three, sort of three aspects of sleep. I am falling asleep very easily. I am sleeping soundly and deeply, and I am awakening refreshed and restored and invigorated to start my day. So that's putting it in the, what would we like to create? So claim it. And then as far as the asking for help and all those unemployed angels that Dolores was seeing <laughs> floating up there, just wishing that somebody <laughs> would pray so that they could help, you know, because they literally are unemployed if we don't ask for help, <laughs> mm -hmm. seriously, um, is to then ask a question, what would it take? So sometimes people have trouble saying, well, I am, if I say I am falling asleep easily and sleeping well through the night and waking up refreshed, a lot of people will go, but that's not true and I can't even say it because they go, I, I just can't even say it because they're so misaligned with that. So a way to get there, if they can't quite claim that what they're choosing is to ask a question, which invokes those unemployed angels and your guides and angels to start working with you. And it goes like this, what would it take, that, those starter phrases to any question, what would it take for me to fall asleep easily? sleep soundly through the night and awaken refreshed and reinvigorated and you know exciting for my day and in in the asking it is given so when we say what would it take for x your desired experience what would it take for that to appear you now have invoked permission of the unseen realms to come and help you as well as the seen realms you simply ask that question and you will find that you'll be at a grocery store and standing there and two people will have a conversation in front of you and say, oh, you know what I found is that, you know, helping me get to sleep fast, I'm taking hops, tincture, you know, before I go to sleep, which is a tip, by the way. Um, and, <laughs> but, but when you ask for help, help can arrive from everywhere. And if we just say, gosh, I'm having a terrible experience with my sleep, you're claiming it you're attaching to the problem. You're not saying, okay, enough of that. What would I love to experience? So for people to realize how powerful we are as energetic creators and just stop and say, okay, what's happening with my sleep now? Write it down and then say, now that's on the left side. Now, if on the right side, I could transform that to a fantastic, amazing, different situation, what would it be? And that gets people into creating and claiming the solution. And then you ask, what would it take for X to appear? What would it take for, you know, this to shift in my life? What would it take for, I asked this one 10 years ago, what would it take for the pain in my hips to go away? And within three days, I was guided to a woman taking a walk in the dog park who told me about gluten and American wheat and how inflammatory it was. And so I go, well, that was guidance. And stop eating American wheat within five days, my pain had declined by 80% because I am. Um, yeah, I love that. I think that's such a great practice. Thanks for sharing that, Janet. And I think that's something people can do. And I think that is a great exercise for so many things, as you said. Um, and I love that verbiage. We'll, we'll get that to people. So the actual verbiage Go ahead and borrow those I am statements and make those your sleep affirmations. Thank you, Janet. That was gorgeous. 
All right, Dr. Dolores, tell us what is- I'm going to piggyback on all this wonderful information that everybody shared. It's, it's really about experimenting and making something your own, okay? Like, you know, if something is, you're resonating to want something that uh, uh, each one of us talk to, I invite you to go and, and play with it. You know, sometimes, you know, we all tend to be skeptics until we start, you know, making it a game and, you know, let me just try one thing and see if it makes a difference and keep, you know, looking at things and, you know, allowing yourself to be led to your next step, just like, you know, Janet so beautifully explained. It's like, you just never know where the information's going to come. We have a plethora of knowledge here. This is just the starting point. You could go someplace, you know, listen to, listen to your intuition as to where you're led and you'd be surprised what is going to show up. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Um, and I'm going to say that start with your bedroom. It is very reflective of your mental state. <laughs> so if, if you come into your bedroom and it doesn't feel like a sacred space for sleeping for you, then what are you going to do first? So I like to tell people if you're, if you're in this state of complete overwhelm, so your bedroom is a disaster and you don't want it to be that way, where are you going to start? You're going to set a timer for 10 minutes and you're going to pick your nightstand or one small area and you're going to get a yummy drink of some sort. You're going you're gonna to turn on your favorite song. You're going to set a timer for 10 minutes and your intention is just going to be to declutter and create a sacred nightstand. And when the 10 minutes stop, you're going to just praise yourself for getting through it. You did so good. And you're going to retrain your reticular activating system to love this idea of you decluttering and creating a beautiful space. And then you just multiply that. You do it another 10 minutes and another 10 minutes. I'm going to tell you right now, if you're one of those people that's going to get through that 10 minutes and then go into full power mode, like, well, now I'm just going to do it all. Don't do that. Don't do that. Just give yourself 10 minutes and celebrate it. Go have a bath. Go get a yummy cup of tea. Go read a book that you love. You know, really reinforce your intention to create a sacred space for yourself and then just do little installments. Um, and I think that's a great practice. And for me, that is what worked for me to really just start to associate that as a joy-filled activity. And now I love to declutter. I love to keep my bedroom a gorgeous space. It is something that really lights me up. It makes me feel good. I come into my bedroom at the end of the day. My bed is made. It's clean. It's clear. It looks like a hotel room. So it feels like a place where I can curl up and be comfortable and get a great night's sleep. So that would be my top tip. So we have given you some juicy, juicy information today. Um, I'd like to thank Dolores and Janet and Jen for sharing their knowledge and expertise on sleep. I feel like we're going to have to have a sleep part two because there were some great topics that we could probably spend a little bit more time on. Um, and I want to thank you all for tuning in, for listening. Um, and I invite you to follow us and join us on the road to wellness. Um, you can check out the notes to see um, some of the ideas that we've captured and the top tips and some resources for you. And as always, you can certainly reach out to any one of us and we'd be happy to give you some support on your personal journey. All right, everyone, take care. And I hope you have a great night's sleep. <laughs>